that the practice in Arabia, um, and it's whether it was, it seems like it was both in both in Mecca and Medina, is that we know that men were turbaned and women would wear a scarf or a head covering called the khimar. But the practice in pre-Islamic Arabia was that they would put the khimar, instead of the khimar coming down, they would put it to the back. So it would be tied to the back, leaving the chest area exposed. And that the juyub, which is the opening in the chest area, was in the practice of pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, probably both in Mecca and Medina, was that it would be wide open. So because of the wide opening, what the cleavage would clearly show. Um, and then they would, a lot of times, wear um, uh, necklaces, not not the, the modern, thin, you know, uh, decorative necklaces, but uh, the, if you've ever seen traditional qala'id or traditional necklaces, um, they they could be, you know, quite thick. Uh, they're, they're quite decorative, and they would come... Now, but still, the chest area would be quite exposed. This revelation, which comes and says that covered this chest area. Instead of the khimar being tied to the back, the khimar then is tied to the front to cover the chest area. Um, there is quite a bit of traditions that revolve around this revelation. So there's a hadith um, Asma bin Zaid uh, that women come to visit her that women they come she sees them she sees them um, let me see if I can actually give you the entire yeah yeah this is it أسماء بنت مرشدة كانت في محلها في بني حارثة فجعل النساء يدخلن عليها غير متأذرات ومتذرات بوس فيبدو ما في أرجلهن من الخلاخل من الخلاخل وتبدو صدورهن وذوائبهن فقالت أسماء ما أقبح هذا فأنظر فأنزل الله قل للمؤمنات يغضضن من أبصارهن وأحفظن فرجهن. So this is uh, again said as an occasion for revelation that she was Asma bint Murshida or this is of course the same as Asma bint Zaid um, Murshida is uh, her mother anyway that she was in, in, in Bani Haritha among the tribe of Bani Haritha and women were coming in and the way they were dressed, their legs showed and their chest showed as well. Um, so she said, "Ma akbah this, this, this is this is just like she was repulsed by it. She thought they were um, too. Re they revealed too much, and that was a, that was the occasion for the revelation of." Uh, this area. Um, you get, of course, many other reports, um, among them that this area was uh, revealed because of Asma bint Abu Bakr. This is the famous tradition where um, the, the Prophet ﷺ sees Asma and she is wearing something that is revealing, and he tells her, 
uh, when a woman reaches um, uh, age, becomes of age, uh, nothing should show of her except her hands and her face. The, this tradition, however, most scholars um, question its authentic, authenticity because it was reported by Khalid bin Darik, and Khalid bin Darik never met Aisha. So it, there's a missing link. The Khalid bin Darik could not have heard it from Aisha because they've never crossed paths. Um, anyway, but the crux of the matter, and to get to the heart of it, is... Most classical sources understood this to require both a khumar, a head cover, and a head cover that, at least in, in Surah An-Nur, that covers the chest area. So that the khumar, instead of being tied in the back, it would come to the front and be tied in the front. And that the... Also, as we will see, it says something about covering the legs. Well, let's get to it. So, and furthermore, that that the practice, pre-Islamic practice, of women wearing necklaces that they, they, they were like jangles. They would make noises as women walk. So you, they would bring attention. And it wasn't high-class women that would wear that. It was women that w would, as reports say, that the women who, uh, who wear ankles that sort of jingled and make distinct noise, um, were women in prostitution uh, because they would bring attention to their legs and they would wear things that have a slit so that you can see the leg and this was a way of advertising um, her availability. And that وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِأَرْجُلُهِنْ لِيُعْلَمَ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَةٍ is a prohibition of that. Say, don't bring attention to your legs. At the same time, the crux of the matter here is that it says وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَةَهُنْ that they would cover their zina. What is zina? What is the zina of a woman that she should cover except for the categories that in this ayah are set out? Al-Bu'ula, Al-Aba, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, you have, for instance, a report from Ibn Abbas, wa Qutada, wa Ibn Makhrama that say, well, uh, Zina does not include Nusf al-Zira, that half of the arm, it does not include Nusf al-Saq, that half the leg, that that's not included in Zina. You have, of course, many other reports that says Zina includes everything except the face and hands. But at the same time, this coexists with in numerous early authorities that say that Zina is ma jarat al-ada wa jibilla ala zuhurih. What this means is whatever custom, which Jibilla is nature, the nature of things, uh, says is part of Zina. So let me read to you Muhammad Assad's footnote because I think it will help us save time. Yeah. So, 
He says, yeah, my interpolation, this is footnote 37, my interpolation of the word decently reflects the interpretation of the phrase illa ma zahra minha by several of the earliest Islamic scholars and particularly by Al-Qifal uh, quoted by Razi um, as that which a human being may openly show in accordance with prevailing custom, al ada jariya Although the traditional exponents of Islamic law have for centuries been inclined to restrict the definition of what may decently be apparent to a woman's face, hands, and feet, and sometimes even less than that, as I said, some of them said half the leg or half the arm, he continues, we may safely assume that the meaning of illa ma zahra minha is much wider and that the deliberate vagueness of this phrase is meant to allow for all the time bound changes that are necessary for man's moral and social growth. The pivotal cause in the above injunction is the demand addressed in identical terms to men as well as to women to lower their gaze and be mindful of their chastity. And this determines the extent of what at any given time may legitimately in consonance with Quranic principles of social morality be considered decent or indecent in the person's outward, outward appearance. Um, I'll, I'll go on, footnote 38 is probably also helpful. The noun khimar, of which khumur is the plural, denotes the head covering customarily used by Arabian women before and after the advent of Islam. According to most of the classical commentators, it was worn in pre-Islamic times more or less as an ornament and was let down loosely over the wearer's back. And since in accordance with the fashion prevalent at the time, the upper part of a woman's tonic had a wide opening in the front, her breasts were left bare. Hence the injunction to cover the bosom by means of a khamar, a term so familiar to the contemporaries of the Prophet, does not necessarily relate to the use of a khamar as such, but is rather meant to make it clear that a woman's breasts are not included in the concept of what might be decently be apparent of her body and should not therefore be displayed. So what Muhammad Asad is saying and what I tend to agree with is that word zina, what may appear of a woman, is very much like the concept of modesty, and we'll talk about tabaruj in a second, like the concept of modesty is bound by custom, practice, habit. The pivotal point is modesty. Is it mandatory that a woman covers her hair? In my opinion, and God knows best, Note that the, that the mention is bring the khimar to cover your chest. But there is no normative statement that you must indeed wear the khimar. That's, in my opinion, an Allahu alam. Does this mean all these women who wear the khimar, wear the hijab, should take it off? Absolutely not. Because if they sincerely believe that this is what Allah wants from them, then that's, that's what it, absolutely they should do. And if they sincerely believe this is necessary for their modesty, this is absolutely what they should do. And moreover, there are parts of the world where if a woman is not wearing khimar, not covering her hair, it would be immodest, as there are parts of the word, world where if a woman is not covering her hair, it doesn't mean that she's immodest. But let me, why, it's just to emphasize this point. Is Allah, by saying, bring your khimar upon your bosoms, is Allah saying you must in fact wear the khimar? In my opinion, that if Allah wanted to say you must in fact wear the khimar, Allah wouldn't have left it vague like this. 
because the Khimar was indeed worn like the turban, like the man's turban, as an ornament. Protection from the sun as an, an, as an ornament. The khimar, as we know from, would often be hooked either at the front or in the middle of the head or even in the high classes, the khimar would even be very hooked at the very back, like that, clipped here. So it was indeed an ornament. And the Quranic prescription is, okay, you see that piece of cloth? Cover your bosoms with it. There is a famous hadith attributed to Aisha that when this ayah was revealed, women would rip parts of their lower garments and cover their heads until they became like black crows. Uh, that hadith there's, it has a lot of problems as well. Part of I mean, many problems, but among the problems is that we know that already it, unless you were a slave girl, unless you were a slave girl or extremely poor, women wore a khimar. And so the tradition that says women ripped their, their, their garments to cover their heads would assume that they were going around without a head, without a khimar, which is historically not plausible. This is other than the isnad issues with that tradition. So we get to the, the, the crux of the matter is the interpretation of the earliest authorities as some, as I said, um, as some like Qutada and Ibn Makhrama and so on, who, and, um, and Ibn Abbas who said that it, it does it, it's half the leg and half the arm. Most other authorities said it's the 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 zina that must be covered as in the entire body except for the hands and the face. But when in my and this is again in my opinion on Allahu Alam, is that as I researched this, I found that it was all made pivotal, or the crux of the matter is majarat al-'ada, alay. Now, this takes us to the issue of zina itself. In my opinion, a woman could cover her hair, an entire, cover her entire body, except for the hands and the face, and still violate the Zina rule. The crux of the matter is what was referred to as Tabaruj. A Tabaruj, um, let's see if I, uh, I hope I will. It comes from the word baraja. It comes from a ship showing in the sea. You know how a ship stands out in the sea. Let me see if I can write it. Um, it's it's not it's just about the meaning of of tabaruj where where the word comes from and so it comes from from the word baraja baraja is where a ship stands out in the sea for something to clearly appear so tabaruj is to bring undue attention to the self now a woman could still cover her hair. And oh, the the um, uh, if you're gonna, can you see if you could where it says um, what was the language? Um, um, none of the languages coming to me. Subhanallah, astaghfirullah, shaitan rajeem. Um, so, 
what I'm trying to say is that, and, and the, the reason Tabaraj came up is that if you are bring, bringing or if you are attracting undue attention, even to the face, that is tabarrush. So, if you wear the hijab, but you otherwise wear provocative clothes, like clothes that is very tight, or clothes that is see-through, um, or you wear, you cover everything except the hands and face, but you, it's like the, the expression that I, I hear, um, uh, I don't know if, if it's a current anymore, but maybe I'm, I'm dating myself, but dolled up, is that still in, in use? Like when a woman dolls herself up, yeah? Yeah, th that is tabarosh. Although you're covering the hair, but you become dolled up, you put a lot of makeup to bring attention to your face, to say, basically, look at my, look at how pretty I am. That attention to the, to the physicality of a person, I am pretty, look at me, which in the days of social media is uh, I mean part of Ghadd al Basar by the way is that you don't look you don't watch stuff like that on social media. A proper Muslim in a Ghadd al Basar would not follow people on social media because they doll themselves up or they put a lot of makeup and put themselves on display. Um that is not consistent with Ghadd al-Basr. And it is not a small matter. It's like exactly as Allah says, you do things that you think are small, but in fact they are great and grand with Allah. So is it a very big deal if you are following or looking at in, on social media at women because they have makeup and they look pretty and all of that? Yeah, it is a big deal. That is inconsistent with Ghadd al-Basr. You should not follow. And leave alone that even if a woman doesn't dignify herself or compromises in her dignity by objectifying herself, don't be aun shaytan alayha. Don't be an aid to shaytan by, in fact, giving her what shaytan tells her she wants. And that's views and followers. And it is your job as a Muslim, man or woman, to say, Yahdikullah, may Allah guide you. But I'm not going to support this behavior. Why am I saying all of this? Because the nur that Surah Al-Nur is talking about here is true modesty. Substantive modesty. Yes, Allah sets the parameters that it, it will never be the case that showing cleavage is part of being modest. Why? Because Allah specifically said, cover the jayb. Don't show cleavage. So no woman can come and say, well, showing cleavage is part of modesty. And as we know, where elsewhere, Allah says, lower your jilbab. So, you know, we can get into juristic disagreements as to whether the feet, an inch above the feet, two inches above the feet, three inches above the feet. These are, but substantively, Allah said, the modest thing to do is cover most of the leg. So, the chest and the leg. Now, other than that, it is custom, social standards, and substantive modesty. So, when I see people who consider themselves good Muslims, or people who are happy that a woman is muhajjaba, 
and or a woman that actually wears a hijab because I've seen that like a woman that ha- wears a hijab but then she's on social media has thousands of followers why because she dolls herself up and attracts physical attention what is Islamic in that social media is public space that is the public space are you helping shaitan in a public space or are you obstructing shaitan? Every time you go, it, it is exactly like, like every time you walk in a street, Allah is observing you. Who you say salam, whether you say salam, whether you repeat salam, whether you you do ghadd al-basar, whether you hurt someone. It, it, to our public space today is the, the, the what do you call it, the net? Called net? Th- that's public space. So every time you go there and you hurt someone, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? That you do not commit adha. You don't hurt someone. So every time you go on social media and you care someone, you ta- you slander someone, you backbite about someone, that is a huge haram. That's fahisha. That is fahisha, people. Fahisha. You are committing exactly what Surah An-Nur tells you not to do. Every time you go and you start uh, surfing and watching things you shouldn't watch, and I'm not even talking about something as, as extreme as pornography. I am talking about s- supporting anything that shaitan would be happy about. Don't so, don't be a support to shaitan and when a young girl finds that she's getting attention because of her makeup and she's getting attention because of her physical appearance instead of her intelligence and good moral character and the soundness of her opinions you are being a'un to shaitan. You are helping shaitan. You are as assisting shaitan in corrupting the soul of this person, in objectifying this person, in telling this person, commercialize your dignity and your privacy. Which you, although instead of telling her, your body is not yours and your looks are not yours and it is not you are simply entrusted with these things you are telling her go ahead turn yourself into a commodity and we will applaud you by you know following you by giving you thumbs up by doing whatever people do in the same way you are but at the same time you can't go on the net and curse her or hurt her, or malign her, because that is Eza. Look at how Allah teaches you to flood your space with light. When Allah tells us that this message came to take us out of darkness to light, instead of khubs, instead of khubs, tiba. Tiba has the beautiful nectar of flowers. Tiba is has the the beauty of beauty. It's it's light. It is kindness. It is generosity. It is hamiya. It is to care about one another, to protect one another. That is tiba. Any time that you turn a human being into a commodity, that is not tiba. Any time you turn into a human being into a target practice, let me, you know, slam you as, as harsh as all the harsh words I can muster, that is not tiba. 
Anytime you perpetuate ugliness in public space, that is not tiba. That's chups. And chups and fahisha are close twins. And they originate from one source, shaitan. So Surah An-Nur, to go back to Surah An-Nur, Surah An-Nur is underscoring, again, because I, I know that, you know, in my view, in Allah Alam, in my view, that Allah was not telling you that the crux of modesty is to cover your hair or not cover your hair. That can be decided according to what counts as modest or immodest depending on social circumstance and time and space and all of that. But what Allah was saying is pay attention to substantive modesty. Do not cheapen yourself. Do not commodify yourself. Do not teach yourself to violate your own privacy. If you get to the point where you say the purpose of my body is to put clo- to to commodify commodify myself to people, you have violated your own honor. There was someone who sent a question. Um, said, are you saying that it's haram for women to wear makeup? Listen, I mean, in the, in the tradition, we, we have many reports that women used to wear kuhl and other uh, the, and, uh, ways to, to overcome paleness or a pale look um, uh, and other methods of beautification that was practiced back then. I'm not saying the, the um, I'm when I remember I, I talked last halakha about being I, I used the, the, the colloquial expression dolled up. And what I mean by dolled up, it's the attitude of I am going to paint my face so that I can become a showpiece. That's what I'm talking about. There is makeup where, you know, you, you basically address, you know, you don't want to look pale. You, you want to look um, presentable. And again, I, I think these are all culturally defined. But there is makeup that basically says, stare at my face. Uh, I want to bring attention to my face. And I think that's the problematic makeup. And, and I was commenting, especially in the context of social media, where I, I just find it incongruent and mind-blowing that someone who says they're wearing the hijab, but then sits there and paint their face to say, look at me, I'm so gorgeous. So what's the point? I, I mean, I, then I'm just, I don't get it. Then... If the hijab, if the whole point of the hijab is to to say lower your gaze and don't stare at me. And so you wear the hijab and then you do everything to say stare at me and not just stare at me but follow me and give me uh, likes because you're staring at me and you're admiring me. I mean, I mean, listen, I'm not a woman, uh, and so I always feel awkward talking about this because it's the things that, you know, these are issues that really w- women should talk about. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm overstepping my bounds. Um, but I have a right to pause these questions, and if women can engage me and convince me that that makes sense, because so far, in all the engagements I've had, it just doesn't make sense. It just, and it seems so contrary 
to the whole notion of modesty and Ghadd al-Basar. Um, I mean, even just following someone because you find them good looking is, is inconsistent with Ghadd al-Basar. Follow someone because you think they're intelligent, you think they're pious, you think they're gifted, you think they're uh, artistic, I, I don't know. But to follow someone because they look pretty, how is that Islamic? I, 